On November 5, 2013, ISRO launched Mangalyaan, also known as the Mars Orbiter Mission. And 10 months later, after the probe had traveled 780 million kilometers, it went into Mars orbit, making India the third country after the US and Russia to orbit another planet in the solar system. One of the instruments on Mangalyaan was a Lyman Alpha photometer a device that measures the relative abundance of deuterium and hydrogen. Now, deuterium is hydrogen with one extra neutron. So why do we measure the ratio of deuterium to regular hydrogen? Because it gives us insights about the rate of water loss to outer space from the planet over time. And it's not just Mangalyaan. Almost every space mission to Mars has had a water-related measurement goal. The reason for this is very simple. If you want to find life on another planet, you first have to find liquid water. So think about this. We know water is essential to life on Earth. But scientists also believe that life anywhere in the universe will also mandatorily require liquid water. Dihydrogen monoxide, or as influencers call it, a chemical, is quite possibly the most remarkable molecule in the universe. Let us compare H2O with its closest cousin, H2S. Sulfur is just below oxygen in the periodic table and therefore should have pretty similar properties. But hydrogen sulfide is a gas and it is the smell of kala namak in chaat masala. While water is an odorless liquid at the temperatures biological life tends to prefer, between 0 and 50 Celsius. It turns out that the bond angle in the molecule is 104.5 degrees in water and 92.1 degrees in hydrogen sulfide. Also, the smell of an overcooked egg. This is because sulfur is a larger atom. So the two outermost electrons repel each other less than they do in oxygen, which makes oxygen more electronegative. And that means it grabs protons, which is just an hydrogen atom without an electron, more readily. And in blatant violation of the commandment about not coveting thy neighbor's atoms, it allows oxygen in one water molecule to form milder bonds with other water molecules' hydrogen atoms. And this is called a hydrogen bond. And this ability gives water its most astonishing property. At temperatures above zero, each water molecule is constantly bonding and unbonding, like the plot of a soap serial. So the molecules are close enough on average to make water liquid. But as temperature goes below zero, the molecules don't have enough energy to keep moving around and they can only form one specific kind of hydrogen bond in a hexagonal lattice. So this results in the one property that sets water apart. Its liquid form is denser than its solid form, which is why ice floats on water. In fact, ice is 90% as dense as water, which is why only 10% of the iceberg that the Titanic hit was above water, which then brings us to biology. The chemical bonds and reactions that life requires, proteins, DNA, enzymes and so on, all work only in the presence of water because of this property of forming hydrogen bonds and staying liquid. Remember, life is mostly liquid. Under our skin, we are mostly liquid. In fact, at birth, we are 74% water. And as adults, we are only 59% water if you're a man and 56% if you're a woman. Women have more fat than muscle and muscle holds more water than fat. Something everyone who has tried to mix oil and water knows that fat does not like water. As we continue aging, we lose more water, which also contributes to how really old people look shriveled. So a quick summary of water's role in life. Water is a vital component of cells, which are the building blocks of all living organisms. It facilitates chemical reactions necessary for metabolism and energy production, allowing cells to function properly. Water helps regulate body temperature through sweating and respiration. Regardless of outside temperature, we keep our body temperature at 37 Celsius. So when it's really hot, water evaporates as sweat from our skin. And remember, 
remember all those hydrogen bonds it gives water this special property of high specific heat capacity meaning that it takes a lot of energy to evaporate water a frustrating fact every person in the kitchen knows when they boil milk nothing seems to happen for a really long time because it takes a lot of heat to break the bonds in liquid water to make it water vapor and milk has a layer of fat that prevents this water vapor from escaping so when the pressure eventually exceeds a certain threshold it pushes the fat layer and your milk boils over and this will only happen in the 2 seconds you looked elsewhere that is cosmic truth back to our skin so when sweat evaporates it takes a lot of heat with it thus cooling you down because of the strong negativity of oxygen water is polarized like indian politics so water acts as a solvent transporting essential nutrients minerals and oxygen to cells throughout the body it also aids in the removal of waste products through urine and sweat water is also necessary for digestion as it helps break down food and facilitates the absorption of nutrients in the intestines it is also a key component of saliva which begins the digestive process water also lubricates joints and cushions organs and tissues reducing the risk of injury and discomfort during physical activity water is also involved in various biological processes in all life including photosynthesis in plants which is essential for the oxygen production that supports life on earth adequate water intake is crucial for overall health dehydration can lead to severe health issues including kidney failure seizures and cognitive impairments so that's the physics chemistry and biology of water now let's get practical and look at how critical understanding water is for cooking water is critical to the texture of food when vegetables and fruits retain water they stay crunchy when meat loses water it becomes hard and rubbery when you boil vegetables in water you lose a lot of micronutrients to the water especially if you discard it when we deep fry something the goal is to remove all surface water while the insides should retain water that's what makes a pakoda perfect dry on the outside and soft on the inside in fact the bubbles you see when you're deep frying something that's surface water escaping as steam tip for beginner cooks when the bubbles slow down it means you're pretty close to being done any more and the food will burn so now let's address the most commonly asked questions and doubts about water and also debunk myths let's start with hard and soft water hard water is water into which minerals have been dissolved typically calcium and magnesium salts because most of our fresh water comes from rivers that flow through limestone and other minerals which get into the water hard water tends to leave behind a residue particularly in household appliances like dishwashers or washing machines and hard water will also interfere with soap or detergent's ability to lather when you turn on the shower and your soap or shampoo is simply not working it's probably hard water soft water is water with very little dissolved minerals you can use a treatment plant in your house to soften water and this water is generally preferred for household use but people tend to prefer the taste of hard water which is why bottled water is often called mineral water because it's water to which minerals are artificially added it has a crisper fresher taste while soft water tastes bland which brings me to an important subject about which there is a lot of confusion reverse osmosis an ro filter uses a membrane that only allows anything equal or smaller than the size of a water molecule to go through so it removes everything minerals bacteria viruses dirt etc as a result ro water is completely devoid of minerals now for a while now the government and the who have been recommending that if your water has less than 500 mg per liter of total dissolved solids then you should not use ro the reason for this is that ro will remove almost all of the dissolved minerals and in poor countries like india where many people have diets that are not rich and diverse you risk mineral deficiencies both calcium and magnesium are essential but let's be clear as much as possible you should be getting all your minerals from food not water so as long as you have a balanced diet and your groundwater has very high tds ro water is fine also remember that till recently water bone diseases used to kill a lot of people in india ro filters completely make expensive and laborious things like boiling water completely unnecessary which then brings us to the broader point water treatment now many people living in large 
large apartment complexes in Indian cities have one source of water. The local government pumps water that has been treated with chlorine. Chlorine is absolutely lethal to microbes and it has single-handedly eliminated waterborne diseases that used to be so common even a few decades ago. Now, the amount of chlorine is typically very small compared to, say, the amount of chlorine in a swimming pool. So, it should not be something you need to worry about. In fact, in Western countries, you can just drink tap water without needing to filter it. Some cities in India are almost there. We will get there in the next few years. Now, some people that live in independent houses have two sources of water, groundwater and the city's water. Groundwater is untreated, so it can be hard or soft depending on the place's geography, and it can have a lot of dissolved solids, dirt, and so on. So how you treat it will depend on those factors. In general, it's best to have your local groundwater tested once in a while to determine what to do. If it has more than 500 milligrams per liter TDS, use an RO filter. You can get a TDS meter for very cheap online. If the TDS is very high, consider investing in a treatment plant before you store the water in your overhead tank. Your RO filter won't last very long if the water is too hard. If it is not very hard and TDS is low, you can simply use a UV filter to kill microbes and that way you get to enjoy the sweet taste of water, especially in places like Kerala and coastal Karnataka, where the groundwater is really good. Now let's address the most common water myths. Is alkaline water good for health? Alkaline water is a scam. The original Kangen water was quite literally built on a scam. You can watch my video with the excellent Pranav from Science is Dope where we debunk this. Influencers claim that alkaline water is good for your health. There is zero evidence. And by the way, your blood maintains your pH in a very narrow range between 7.35 and 7.45, no matter what you eat or drink. Most of what we eat is slightly acidic. Drinking alkaline water makes zero difference to your blood pH. If it did, we'd all be dead already. So drinking alkaline water won't harm you. It will, however, harm your bank balance. Should you moon charge or sun charge your water before drinking? Moon charging water is a spiritual practice where water is placed outside under moonlight with the belief that it absorbs the moon's energy. Sun charging is exactly what it says, letting water sit in the sun. The practice is rooted in ancient tradition and influencers have been hyping it of late. Moon charging is believed to improve intuition and enhance feminine energy, whatever that means. And sun charging is supposed to improve vitamin D. The moon is 384,000 kilometers away and it just reflects sunlight. And the sun is 150 million kilometers away. And vitamin D is a fat soluble, not a water soluble vitamin. And the moon is a cold, dead rock whose only effect on the earth is causing tides due to gravity. It is not a plug point to charge your spirituality. Does water have memory? Nonsense. This claim has gone viral many times. And like most viruses, it is not useful. Water is a non-living thing. It does not have any memory. Only advanced living organisms have memory. Inanimate objects like water do not. The water coming out of your tap has absolutely no memory of where it came from. A lake, a sea, or maybe even the holy Ganga herself. Claiming that simple molecules like water have memory is an insult to middle school level science. Does drinking water while standing destroy your knees? No. Your knees have nothing to do with how you're drinking water. Chairs were invented in relatively modern times. Ancient hunter-gatherers were standing most of the time. There is no extra pressure exerted on your knees when you drink water while standing instead of sitting down. Will drinking hot water make you lose fat? Fat does not melt out when consuming hot water. Do you know what actually melts fat? Eating less food. Drinking cold water will cause cold and cough. Cold and cough are caused by specific microbes. Cold water can sometimes irritate the throat. And if you already have a cough, that irritation could make it feel worse. But by itself, cold water will not make you sick. It will not cause cold and cough in your body. Cold is caused by a rhinovirus. Cough is usually caused by streptococcus. Cold water has absolutely nothing to do with this. One should not drink water before, during, after meals. No, drinking water before, during, after meals will not kill the agni or fire inside you for a very simple reason. 
there is no fire inside you. Our body is at 37 Celsius all through. Drinking water will not dilute your digestive juices. Your stomach has a buffering system that automatically produces more or less acid depending on how much water your food has. Remember, most of your food is mostly water. So drink water whenever you like your food will be digested just fine. You must drink eight glasses of water every day. Hydration needs will vary based on activity levels, climate, overall health, etc. There is no magic number. But on average, six to eight glasses is a good intake. But remember, you are consuming water every time you eat a fruit or a cucumber or milk or coffee or tea they all count. Drinking way too much water just to meet some arbitrary target can actually be bad for you because it risks hyponatremia, which is when the salt concentration of your blood goes down. So just drink water when you feel thirsty and drink the amount that makes you feel good and drink it at a temperature that feels right to you. As an Indian, I like drinking water at Indian room temperature. Americans like drinking it really cold. Both are fine. I want to end with a fascinating thought experiment. Pause this video and go and get yourself a cup of water. Drink it. Now, suppose I told you that there is a 100% chance that some of the water molecules in your cup of water flowed through the Ganga in the last thousand years. Would you believe me? You'd probably think, no way. That's the beauty of really large numbers. A cup of water contains 10 raised to the power 24 molecules and 10 raised to the power 17 liters of water flowed through the Ganga in the last thousand years. So the probability that at least one molecule in your cup flowed through the Ganga is effectively 100%. So we are all drinking Ganga water in some sense.